I remember about eight months ago, I was on stage with my band getting ready to do a performance and my phone rang right before we started. I looked down, it was my brother. So I answered it and he says, hey, are you going to Utah? And I said, no, we're in the San Francisco Bay Area tonight at a show. Why, what's going on? He says, well, I think you're gonna be going to Utah because a meteor just flew right over Salt Lake City and maybe broke up out in the desert west of the town. And it's all over the news right now. So I finished my show and the next day I called all my buddies that are in the meteorite hunting community, friends of mine. And sure enough, it was confirmed and we we're already working on a map of where they might have landed. So within a day or so, I was out in Salt Lake City on the ground in the desert for three full days searching for pieces of this event. I got lucky and I saw a hole in the sand. You probably saw the video, if not, here's a link to that video right here, the full length video. Take a look at that. This video that I put up, this full length video that I just showed you a link to up here, got a lot of controversial comments about it. I wasn't, I, I was shocked to see what people actually think about meteors and meteorites and how confused they are about a lot of the information. So then I made a short, a couple short videos about it. And I did a couple versions of uh, 60 second videos on it and man, even more crazy comments came in. So I decided to make this video. It's a response video to those videos and my experience as a meteorite hunter. So stay tuned and I'll teach you everything you need to know about meteors and I'll answer a lot of your questions and concerns you might have when you saw my videos. All right, we'll be right back. So like I said, I took a look at all the comments that you guys left and there was some pretty crazy things I read and some pretty good questions as well. So I'm just gonna kinda of make that list and I'll start at the top of the list and kinda of work my way down, it's my own list, but number one, where do they come from? They come from outer space, obviously from the asteroid belt. Typically they're from parent bodies in the asteroid belt and these are giant rocks, if you will, that are floating around in space. Some of them are the size of a building, some are the size of entire cities and some are even bigger than that. And some of these, uh, giant rocks that are floating around are hit by other objects where pieces break off in weird angles and sometimes intersect us and come into Earth's atmosphere at weird angles. And I will say also that there are some real special meteorites that come from other planets. So we've, we have pieces of the moon that make it here. We have pieces of Mars, for example. So this is probably an impact that hit the moon from another object and it blew stuff off the surface of the moon and it made it into our gravitational pull and rocks from the moon have been found here on earth that were ejecta from events on the moon. Same thing with Mars too. We have pieces of Mars here that we found. So they come from, like I said, parent bodies of asteroids and from other planets and they come from space. How fast did they come in? Wow, I'll tell you, they come in at all kinds of crazy speeds. If you type in how fast do meteors hit the earth you're gonna get all kinds of different answers. So it depends on how you word that. While they're flying in space, they can be as fast as I saw on Google, 133,000 miles per hour. Most commonly they're 17 to 40,000 miles per hour when they hit our atmosphere. So they come at crazy speeds, but they come to a screeching halt very quickly when they hit our atmosphere. In space, they have nothing to stop them except other objects that they might hit on the way. But when they get into our gravitational pull, and into our dense air and our atmospheres, the air gets heavier. And these things encounter so much friction up there that they slow all the way down and all that energy is lost up there from those high speeds to slow speeds. And that energy takes the form of transformation into heat and light. So you see a bright flash typically on these events as they're entering our atmosphere. And you also can see smoke trails from the heat as the objects are heating up and sometimes they'll break off and you'll see a train of them where there's multiple pieces in a train with different smoke trails coming off of those and all kinds of things can happen. You can also have sonic booms if the object is big enough and it reaches uh, you know, low enough altitudes here where it's 120 to 60 miles above the earth and it's still something coming at us. We can often get sonic booms and there was an event in Russia in 2012, which I'll put up on the screen right now, in an area called Chelyabinsk, a very famous event where a meteor the size of a home uh, came in and you can see that the streaks in the sky were quite huge. It was caught on multiple different dash cameras. And we saw a lot of Russians outside with their cameras and their phones looking at the, the smoke in the sky, the, the smoke trails. And little did they know that about six minutes after the event happened, the 
slow moving sound waves, which are quite slower, came all the way down and hit the earth in the form of sonic booms. The sonic booms from this event were massive. They were so powerful that they collapsed roofs in the area and broke thousands of windows all across that part of the country. In fact, all of the injuries of which there were several were from the building collapses themselves. So this event was remarkably powerful and the sonic booms were so powerful that they, like I said, collapsed buildings. And when we as meteorite hunters and the meteorite hunting community hear that there's an event with sonic booms, we're quite interested in those because that usually means that an object made it all the way down to lower altitude and there's a good chance that this thing made it to the surface of the earth where we can go look for them. Most all the events that we know of in modern times slowed all the way down to a point where they just became a free fall at a speed of what we call terminal velocity. And you would have to Google how, what is the terminal velocity of a meteor or, you know, a meteorite, depending on how you word it again. You're going to see speeds anywhere from 200 to 400 miles per hour, generally speaking. So that means that as the object came in, traveling at incredible speeds of, let's say, 30,000 miles per hour, it slowed all the way down to some point from all the friction of the earth that it just actually just fell straight down. Now it did carry a lot of its momentum as it was coming in at an angle like for example this way and here's the earth surface. As it was coming this way at some point it slowed all the way down to terminal velocity and started to fall. It will still carry some of its inertia from its mass and continue in the forward direction and when that happens we see the bigger pieces continue on further down the strewn field and the lighter pieces fall off first. So out in the strewn field, we'll see something like this where we have the small stuff back here and then we have the medium stuff in the middle and the big heavy guys made it all the way down to the end of the strewn field. So that's generally how they fall to earth. Let's go ahead and take a break for a second and we'll be right back. All right, some of these stones are absolutely beautiful and incredible to look at, and the, you have to remember that they were formed in space, in the vacuum of space. So as the particles all gathered and combined, we don't see the effects of gravity ever in the way that they combine. So they're extraterrestrial in the way that they combine in the vacuum of space. And when we cut them open here, we look and we see all kinds of crazy patterns, like the one you're seeing on the screen right now called the Widmann-Staten pattern. This is a crazy pattern that can only be made in space. And that's one of the reasons why these things are so collectible and so beautiful. Here's another picture of one with several gemstones in it. You can see here, this is a, an incredible inside slice of a very beautiful meteorite with gemstones. What is the risk of death from one of these things? Well, you could type that in Google again and. And, you know, I, I get a lot of people saying they don't believe anything they see on Google, and I can understand that. But generally speaking, the, the body of text um, that is in Google about things like this come from scientific journals, and they're well accepted in the scientific community. So I think what you're reading in there is, like I say, well accepted in the scientific community. And, and you could probably believe things like this that you type in there. So anyway, the risk of death from uh, an event, well, first of all, Let's start with the fact that there even has to be an event because if there's not an event, there's no risk of death. But when there is a meteor event, so you have about a 510,000 to one chance of being in the area where a meteor will hit the ground. So 510,000 to one, if there is an event, you know, there is one coming in, you have a 510,000 to one chance of being somewhere in its area or underneath it where it could hit you. Now to hit you as a person, the odds are 765 million to one. So over 765 million to one, that if there is an event, first of all, you have to have the event because it's a zero risk if there's no event. And, and the math on day to day, just hour to hour with no event, I don't know that math, the numbers would be crazy. But if there is an event, the chance of you being hit by that event are 765 million to one. So again, mathematicians, you know, work out the stats on this and those are pretty good odds. 
but uh, if, if one did hit you and it was big enough, it could be pretty bad. So we had an event here in California uh, about, I don't know, five or six months ago and during fire season. It was right at the end of fire season and a guy claimed that a meteor hit his home and then his home caught on fire. And it was all over the news. It got national media. It made it, well, it was international media. It was all over the world news that a meteor caused this guy's trailer home to burn down. And the, even the fire captain that responded, who didn't know anything about this, believed it and thought maybe that could have been that. And he went on the record saying that. And so anyway, it all got retracted later. So fire from a meteorite. So when these things come in, again, they do heat up at incredible heat, just like the bottom of the space shuttle when it re-enters our atmosphere. It gets literally red hot from all that friction as it's hitting the bottom. And these things are coming in pretty quick, way faster than the space shuttle's coming in. The space shuttle sneaks in and just kind of just falls with gravity and it still gets red hot. You can imagine how hot the surface of a meteorite gets. And it gets so extremely red hot that it causes the object to break apart into several pieces and morph into rounded shapes where it's burned on all edges pretty much. Sometimes you can get kind of lucky and one will come in at one angle and never change and never tumble. And at that one angle, it'll just burn the bottom and cause like what looks like a heat shield effect on the bottom. And sometimes the back end of the meteor can be protected and not be as burnt as the front. Or you could have one coming in and it breaks up late, late in its fall. And as it breaks apart in the, in the sky late in the fall, the, all the major burning has already occurred around the outside edge, but as, as it broke open, a fresh surface was exposed and barely burnt because it was at the very end of the burn. So sometimes you can see a broken section that wasn't quite as burnt as the rest of the meteor. So there's all kinds of really cool different kinds of morphology or you know topology on these things because of the way that they come into the Earth's atmosphere at these extremely high temperatures. All right, on your screen right now, you can see a picture of a meteorite that is an iron type meteorite that has these big, what we call thumbprints. And the scientific term for those are regnoglyphs. These are unique signatures from the heating of a metallic or iron meteorite as it reaches these extremely high temperatures. Sometimes you can see in this picture here that you get like flow lines as well where the melted material began to flow and like I said earlier, some of these shapes are quite valuable. The more crazy the shape, the more valuable typically. And the more it shows the entry, the more valuable as well, because the more it kind of tells the story of where it came from and how hot it got. Now, getting back to the fire from meteorites, yes, they're extremely hot in the sky when they're falling and they can hit the ground at pretty hot temperatures, but I don't know of, um, I could be wrong about this, but I personally do not know of any documented fires from meteorites hitting the ground, meteors hitting the ground and, and at such high temperatures still that they still had enough heat to start a fire. The, the fact is, is they cool way down on their last 20 to 40 miles, or I'll say the last 60 miles of their fall. They've lost so much momentum and they're hitting so much cool air that they cool way down. And I think that you would have to have a quite large piece that would have so much heat in the inside of it that it would still retain some heat uh, if it was found on the ground to even still be warm, let alone to be hot enough to start a fire. So I do not know of any meteors ever causing fires when they hit the ground. Therefore, I don't think meteorites cause fires, but could be wrong, but that's just what I know about it. Let's go on to another topic that uh, was the number one most talked about thing in all of my videos was the size of the crater. So what I was hoping for is I was hoping that I get a mathematician to come into one of my videos and that they could look at the crater that I found this stone in and they could examine it. And when you look very carefully, I'm gonna zoom in here at a photo of the crater itself. When you look very carefully at the sand, the dirt, it's a dry lake bed. It's a very, very dense dirt. It's not your typical dirt and it's not even really sand, it's like flower. It's just a flower. It's so fine of a material. It is a dry lake bed and there's a crust on top you can see there. And so this thing came in fast enough to break through the crust and sink all the way straight down in that really fine substrate material to a depth of about 10 to 11 inches deep overall. 
Now, how much energy does it take for that rock to go down and that deep into that kind of soil? If we could figure that out somehow, then we could work backwards with the equation of E equals MC squared. So to speak, we can kind of look at how many feet pounds of energy is required to sink a stone 11 inches down into that dirt. And if you look here, another, another thing I want to show you in the photo here is look at the very bottom down there when I pull the stone out right here. You can see this rounded, smooth area down there from, that, that retains the exact shape of the stone, which therefore leads credence to the fact that it came in and was actually a meteor that I found that fell from the sky. So a lot of people said, oh, you drove by in a car and threw it out the window, or you know, there was all kind. nobody wanted to believe what really happened. What really happened is it fell from the sky at two to 400 miles per hour and made a hole in the dirt. So anyway, again, I was hoping for that mathematician to come around and look down and see the hole and kind of just do some work where they could figure out how many feet pounds of energy it would require to do that and then give us a number, how many feet per second or how many miles per hour would an object have to fall straight down to make a hole in the dirt that deep? Then we would know the speed, but generally speaking, it's gonna be somewhere between two to 400 miles an hour, and I know that because that's terminal velocity of the speed of a stone falling from, let's say you put a hot air balloon, if you're able to put a hot air balloon up at 100,000 miles, or sorry, 100 miles above Earth and drop it out from 100 miles, how, how, much, how much speed would it have by the time it hit the ground? Two to 400 miles per hour. That's terminal velocity. So terminal velocity is different for all types of objects. Terminal velocity for a feather is gonna be different than a bowling ball and so forth, but somewhere in that range is about how fast it hit the ground. All right, for example, let's use a bowling ball to illustrate this. So let's say you have a 10 pound bowling ball. Actually, let's make it eight pounds, an eight pound bowling ball, and we roll it down the lane at 10 miles per hour. And when it hits the pins, I'm gonna pull this number out of thin air, but let's say that eight pound bowling ball hits the pins going 10 miles per hour and it does 80 feet pounds of energy on impact. So you would think that with some simple arithmetic, if you just double the weight of the ball and roll it, now you have instead of an eight pound ball, we have a 16 pound ball and you roll it at the same speed, 10 miles per hour, would it do double the feet pounds of energy? In other words, would it do 160 instead of 80? Well, the answer is yes, it would. That's how that equation works. But let's change the speed. Let's go back to the eight pound bowling ball instead of 10 miles per hour and hitting at a speed of 10 miles per hour and causing 80 feet pounds of impact. Let's say we double the speed now. When you double the speed of the ball and it's going 20 miles per hour, we get quite a different number because speed is squared in that equation. So we get, instead of 160 feet pounds of energy, we get a whole bigger, crazier number. That's because speed is, like I say, it's squared in the equation. So when you have an object coming in the size of this, for example, at 33,000 miles per hour and it hits the earth, the energy from that would be incredible. It would set off seismic sensors all around the area. It would immediately turn, it would vaporize this object into nothing. It would just completely annihilate this object. There would be nothing left to find at that speed and it would cause extensive damage and heat. Uh, the crater would be so massive and it would be literally, this, the dirt would turn to glass. It would be an inc incredible amount of energy. Now, I reported in my video that this was seen going 33,000 miles per hour because that's what NASA reported when they saw this object coming in. But I didn't tell you that it hit the earth at terminal velocity of two to 400 miles per hour. Had I done that, maybe the impact hole would have made a lot more sense. So a lot of the comments I got were just mass confusion from uh, what they thought was something going 33,000 miles per hour, and I find this little tiny hole in the ground and pop a stone out. Made no sense to them. So there was that. That kind of covers the whole crater thing. Again, the crater is, I'll tell you right now, the crater is the crater. Here's a picture of the crater right now. There's the crater that it made. The object was 484 grams that I found. It fell between two to 400 miles per hour. It hit the dirt and there's the hole. The end of story, no crater. It's just that little impact. Some people say that I dug a hole or I threw it in the mud or whatever, but this is what a crater looks like in the middle of a dry lake bed <laughs> in the summertime from a stone hitting it two to 400 miles per hour from straight above. 
end of story. Okay. Next thing, um, I got a lot of comments about radioactive. People were saying, oh my God, he's touching that with his bare hands. Well, now he's got radioactivity on him. Are meteorites radioactive? Well, you could Google that too, and you're going to get the same answer from every different source that Google finds, and that is, yes, they are radioactive. But they are no more radioactive than any terrestrial rock here on Earth. In fact, oftentimes a banana here, a fruit banana has more radioactivity in it than a meteorite that you pick up off the ground. So there's all kinds of great information about that on Google that you can look at from scientific journals. And, and there are some really rare types of meteors that have a little more radioactivity in them than um, a terrestrial rock, but they are not at dangerous levels. And that is not an issue. When I reached down and grabbed this stone out of the ground with my bare hand and pulled it out, it's because of a couple different things. Number one, several pieces had already been found and one of those were already turned into science, it was already given to a university, so I knew that. So had there been no pieces given to science yet, there would have been some scientific value for me to have handled the stone with gloves carefully so that I don't contaminate it with my human oils and skin germs and everything else and reach down and pick it up. And now when it gets studied, they're gonna find all kinds of my germs on it. But let's also keep in mind that this thing was found underground, in a hole in the mud, in, in the moist soil. So there's already major earth contamination on this rock from all of the different bacteria that live in the dirt that are already on the stone. So if I would have had gloves on and pulled it out very carefully, and never touch it with the human hand, it's still gonna have earth germs all over it, which almost makes it completely uh, worthless to study for um, what you might call, you know, germs from outer space. So getting back to the radioactive thing, that's kind of behind us now. We talked about that. They're no more radioactive than a, a, a earthly stone, a terrestrial rock here. And then getting back to the germ thing, that was another thing I saw that he picked up space bugs. Here we go. This guy just picked up space bugs and he's going to cause, you know, an epidemic of, there's, there's a word for it, panspermia, where I pick up a new germ from space and spread it to everybody and now we all have a space germ. Well, we've never had that happen and it's never been documented. Um, I did pick it up with my bare hands and touch it and keep in mind the story I just told you about the heat that these things encounter on the way in. Anything that's alive on that stone is completely killed on the way in at these extremely high temperatures. So it's not likely that anything could survive on the outside of the stone, the part that I'm touching. Now, if someday we find that there is a germ inside a stone, it's gonna be found way on the inside where the heat never got up to, to destroy it. Um, it's not gonna be on the outside where we're touching these. So that's not an issue either, uh, at least not to my knowledge, and 99.9% and .9 of us pick these up with their bare hands. So. And one last thing about contamination, when we're out picking these up off the ground, we're well aware that they're valuable to science, to academia, to colleges and universities and schools and museums, um, to NASA, to the scientific community in general, uh, because they could have the building blocks of life in them. This is a known theory, you know, that you've heard of the primordial soup theory. If you've not heard of that, take a look at it. I'll put a, some text up on the screen right here. You can look at that and, and Google that if you want. But it's a theory that the life on Earth was started from organic material that fell to Earth in the form of meteorites and dissolved in hot liquid and formed amino acids. And these amino acids became the building blocks of life and eventually RNA and DNA and all these kind of things came to be. And that's a theory. So we're always chasing what's inside these rocks that could be you know, especially when you have amino acids and stuff like that, a lot of them do have amino acids in them. So we're able to see that there are the building blocks of life in these and they're quite valuable because of that. So when we're out picking these up with our bare hands, if it's sitting right on top and it hasn't rained and it hasn't been contaminated, it's right on top, most of us are gonna pick them up with gloves and handle them very careful with aluminum foil and all these types of things we carry with us. And we know that when we buy, sell, or trade them, they're quite valuable when they're uncontaminated because of the precautions that the meteorite hunters use when they pick them up. So if you ever are able to find one of these someday, maybe you'd be better off by just picking it up very carefully with some aluminum foil or some gloves or something, some latex or rubber gloves, 
and putting it right into a baggie and sealing it. But if it's underwater, it's in mud, if it's been rained on, all these things are going to cause contamination that makes the whole being very careful thing not as important anymore. So that's just something that we think about. All right, very common question was, is how do we know where to look for meteorites? Well, there's recent fresh falls. These are witnessed recent events all around the world. And then there's old historical strewn fields too. You could look for meteorites at either one of those types of places. But what I mostly do is I look for recent fresh falls. And we look at uh, all the reports that come in on the internet. Now, when someone sees a fireball, they typically go on Facebook or social media and say something about it. But what I wish they would do is go to this website right here. You'll see on the screen right now. This website is a good place to report a fireball and it asks you very specific questions. It give, it, and when you put all this information in there, it gives us all the information we need to see a possible trajectory. So all we need is three points of reference. So if we just get three different reports saying what they saw and the direction, sometimes just those three reports will give us enough information to triangulate a possible trajectory. So then we also look at the whole overall group of all the reports and what time they came in and get a possible time for it. So we have a time, a date, and we know the general area. And we know now if there's more than three reports, even possible trajectories. So then what we do is we take all that information and we look to see if there was sonics. If, was there noise? Was there a sonic boom? Because if there was, then that really gets us interested. And if we have enough information that looks like it was moving fast and not slow, Therefore, it was possibly a meteor and not space junk. And maybe it had a sonic boom associated with it. And there was a lot of reports. It was witness. It's on cameras. Well, this gets us really fired up. And the next thing you know, we're taking all that data and we're going into weather satellites, into Doppler radar satellites. And we're taking the not just satellites, but Doppler radar stations. And they're all around the world, typically. And here on the west coast of California, we have many around here. But basically, what you do is you kind of get in the area where all the reports were and you look at the approximate time and date and you look for things falling through the sky in slices of time using weather radar. Now these weather radar can see not only moisture and raindrops, but they can see airplanes, aircraft, flocks of birds. They can see bees, giant insect, clouds of insects. They can see smoke and they can also see falling rocks falling through the sky. And then when we find them, we watch them as they're falling through the sky and then we use other types of software like dark flight modeling software to estimate where they would have landed and then we create a virtual X marks a spot treasure map and it gives us a good place to go start looking and then we um, you know if it's public property or uh, even if it's in a city or something and we can find a way to get permission to go out there on private property we do that and we go out and look for the meteorites and oftentimes we have to make deals with property owners to get on their property, share deals and stuff like that, percentages and you know whatever it takes. And then of course there's different rules about public land as well. But anyway, you need to read up on all that. I'm not going to cover all that in this video, but once you know you're okay to look, then we go out and search the fields and, and try to find where these things are at. And they're typically on a map in a stretch area and the lighter stuff falls off first and the heavier stuff goes further away. So depending on the trajectory on the map, I'll show you on the screen right now, here's a map for the fall that we just had uh, in Salt Lake City back in August. And it shows you that the event started falling right on the edge of town and skirted the side of the Great Salt Lake and then it went across the Great Salt Lake and then out into the flats west of town where Several pieces were went all, made it all the way down to Highway 80 almost, down to the Morton Salt Plant. Now, that's a mixture of several different types of land in there, but basically we just look at this thing and start walking in the strewn field of where we think they are, and that's how we find them. We know what we're looking for. In that case, we're looking for a black, dark black rock right on top of a white or tan flat pool table, flat surface in a dry lake bed. Very easy to spot. I think a total of 16 pieces were found on the Great Salt Lake event that we know of anyway, including mine. Three of those were found underground in holes exactly like mine by three different detect or three different uh, searchers. Um, so mine was found a couple days after one was found underground uh, in a hole. Uh, and then 
a day after mine was found in a hole, a friend of mine found a third one in a hole. And like I said, they were all about the same size hole. The crater looked the same on all three of them, about the same depth on all three, and they were very similar in weight as well. Nothing was found much bigger than that. The, the biggest piece we found was one that was about 50% uh, larger than mine, and uh, that was the biggest piece found. And no other pieces were found that I know of now. There's been other falls since then. Uh, there was you know, a couple other falls, and I'll tell you what, take a look at this website right here. I'm kind of skipping ahead a little bit. But take a look at this website right here. This is kind of a cool website you can use to see recent events and look at the maps that were drawn and get a feel for how we uh, go look for fresh falls. Uh, to find historical falls, again, it's very similar. There's known areas where there's known strewn fields. For example, down on the Franconia exit of Highway 10 in Arizona, there are several known strewn fields in an area we call the DCA, or Dense Collection Area. This is all on public land. So if you go out there with a the metal detector or a magnet and start walking around anywhere in the DCA, you're likely to come across one of several known strewn fields that all overlap. And these are all you know, tens of thousands of years apart from each other. Who knows how long ago these events happened? We just don't know because they're historical, prehistorical, I should say. So anyway, that's the two different types of meteorite hunting we do, and that's how we find them. So I remember several years ago, I was at home and I got a phone call from my son. He was coming home from work and he was coming over on top of a hill on the freeway. And as soon as he got to the top of the hill, across in his view, coming this direction, what he saw was a giant object glowing in the sky coming in really fast and he watched it fall all the way to the earth and he knew exactly where it hit. He said he saw, he knew what town it was that it fell and hit. And from his point of view where he was at, and where he saw it hit, it looked to him like it was right on that town. So he told me the town name and I waited till he got home. We went into Google Earth and I went into Street View of Google Earth. And then I went and got myself up on the freeway in a, in a you know, virtual vehicle, looking exactly the view that he saw and about where he was at when he saw it. And we just, from that view in Google Earth looking out, he showed me in the sky where this thing was seen. So. Let's say from your point of view, you're driving this way. What he saw was an object coming from here and landing right on this city. So it was coming this direction. And he knew right where the town was. So what I did is I used Google Earth and I turned the street view into flat view again. And I drew a line from right where his vehicle was to that city and out. And in that line were multiple cities going out for hundreds of miles. Any one of those cities in that line could have been where it landed, not just where he saw it, because ironically, where he saw it hit was a city about 20 miles away. That's what he thought, when it really turned out to be many hundreds of miles away. And this happened in the, the Bay Area in a town called Pittsburgh, California, where he saw this happen. So he was in Pittsburgh, California, and he thought it landed in Antioch, California, because that's what his eyes told him. But where it really landed was way past Antioch in Battle Mountain, Nevada. So once again, we looked at different reports and we looked at the timestamp and, and we were able to figure out quickly that this event actually was seen more in the area of Nevada than it was here in California. And then the trajectory of it and everything and the times we used to you do exactly what I just told you and came up with a map. And several people went out there. I couldn't make that one because of obligations with my band. Uh, we were on tour. And I just couldn't break away to go to that fall to search for it. But I wanted to get my son a piece of that fall because he saw that event. So he watched that thing come all the way down and hit the ground. So for Christmas that year, I got him a slice of Battle Mountain. So this is a, a slice from a stone that was recovered. And I purchased this from the finder who had that stone sliced up and here is a slice, I'll show you a close-up picture of that real quick, of the stone that my son saw falling to earth, and now he has it in his collection. And this is a, uh, a piece of something he watched come in from space. How cool is that to actually see it, witness it, and now have a piece of it. So 
I thought that was really neat. I gave it to him for Christmas and it's one of his favorite things. So I wanted to show you that real quick. When we talk about the uh, value of these things. So when it comes to value, it's quite different as far as the fresh witnessed falls versus the historical falls. And then also there's rare types too. So there's rare, not only types, but classifications of types. It gets pretty complex. But there are some types I know that in, I think it was 2011, we had an event right here where I live in Northern California that landed right in gold country and it flew over the Reno airport, Reno, Nevada, and came out here and fell all over the ground right in the middle of gold country. In fact, ironically, pieces were found exactly where the first gold was said to be discovered in Sutter's Mill, at Sutter's Mill in the park there in uh, Coloma, California. And I went out there, I was in that strewn field for 21 days straight searching. And I ended up finding a total of, I think I found four pieces all together. And uh, after 21 days and several other people found more than one and quite a bit was found, but that was a very rare type of meteorite. It was nothing like these real heavy, dense metallic rocks at all. It was more like the coal in your barbecue out back. It was that light, that fragile, and that black, and it was a type of meteorite that has very little metal in it. it has water in it, and it had uh, building blocks of life, amino acids. It's very rare and very valuable to science. That stone was selling for $1,000 a gram. Um, on site, there was guys out there with stacks of $100 bills, peeling out hundreds to anyone who walked up to them with them, and um, they were quite valuable, and then those dealers were turning around and selling and trading them to universities, museums who couldn't be there to collect them. Because it was so valuable to science, most of those pieces ended up in uh, academia. The value of them depends on how rare they are. So something like this piece that came from an old historical site, you know, could be only $5 to $30 a gram, depending on how rare or how cool it is. And that, you know, it's dependent upon the weight. And then some pieces are, like I said, up to $1,000 a gram. I've never seen anything more than $1,000 a gram, but it, it absolutely could happen. Uh, and then fresh falls, generally speaking, the ones that we're finding, which are the ordinary chondrites, the most common types, the ones that are being witnessed and seen re in recent times, uh, depending on where they're at, you know. I mean, the one that I got that went right over Salt Lake City, that's a major metropolis, a very populated city, and it has kind of a sexy thing to it. It was, you know, the Great Salt Lake. It flew right over the city and landed right outside of town. It could have been a direct hit right on the town and would have broke some windows and, you know, went through cars and all that stuff and it could have been bad, could have been bad. But luckily, this one made it out into a rural area as they usually, as they most often do, and nobody was hurt. But, um, you know, things like that can vary in value from $50 a gram and up, again, depending on size and, and uh, how rare they are. So they're quite valuable in some cases and in some cases they're, they're not. So depends on where you're finding it and if it's a fresh fall, they're gonna be worth a lot more than the historical falls unless it's a really rare historical fall. For example, some historical falls that were not witnessed are pieces of the moon or, the piece, or a piece of Mars and those are very valuable as well because of how rare they are. All right, where are these most often found? Believe it or not, here in the United States, they're most often found in Texas California, and New Mexico. And the reason for that, I think, is just geographically. If you look at Texas, California, New Mexico, there's just so many sparsely populated areas that are open, flat, and easy to search. So it's not like uh, Texas, California, New Mexico have, you know, meteorite magnets that just pull all the meteorites in. It's just, I think, most of them are found here. I think if you went up to the North Pole or South Pole, and just look right on top of the ice, you'd find them everywhere, you know, out there if you could get to them. <clears throat> and a lot of scientists do go look for them at the, at the poles because they are easy to find laying right on top of the ice. So, can you use a metal detector? Yes, and some you can. Like this one here that I found in uh, Arizona. Well, I detected it with the metal detector. And most of them do have a lot of metal in them and can be heard. Now, you may not hear them, you know, from, from deep depths, although there is a friend of mine who used a, a type of metal detector to dig them many feet under the ground in farm fields. A friend of mine named Steve Arnold who had a TV show called the Meteorite Men TV show, and you can watch some of the episodes of that where they used giant metal detectors to go deep in the earth and find huge meteorites that were uh, buried under the ground. So you can use them on most meteorites, however, some of them you can't. So 
Some of them, like the one that was in Sutter's Mill, was undetectable with a metal detector and a magnet was barely even attracted to it because there just was not a lot of metal in that type. So it depends, but uh, I would say most often, yes, you can use a metal detector. So how do you know if you have a meteorite? Boy, that's a loaded question. And there's a lot of Facebook groups and websites that are all about you go on there and, and show them pictures and they'll tell you if it's a meteorite or not. But generally speaking, the things you, you want to look for is the shape of the stone. Um, just I'm going to tell you right now that 99.9% .9 of all the stones that are shown on these websites or these Facebook groups that come from you, the public, are not meteorites. It's very rare for, for one of you to find a meteorite. It's extremely rare. And some people just can't handle the answer that it's not a meteorite. And it just comes with the territory in this hobby. But anyway, if you're looking at a stone and it has any bubbles in it or vesicles or weird uh, small void areas, not a meteorite. That just does not happen with meteorites. If you have a stone that has quartz in it or crystals sticking out of it, not a meteorite. That never happens with meteorites. One test that you can do is you could take your stone and take the top of your toilet tank off. If you carefully lift the, the cover of your toilet tank off and look underneath it, on there there's an exposed area on most of them of the porcelain. And here's a picture on the screen right now showing you the exposed porcelain underneath the back of the tank. You could take your rock that you found and scratch it on that exposed porcelain. And if it leaves a mark on there, it's probably not a meteorite. So meteorites will not leave a mark on exposed porcelain. However, the stones that are most often uh, mistaken for meteorites because they look burnt and just heavy and dense is hematite. And uh, there's also magnetite. There's several different stones, but those will leave a mark on the exposed porcelain. Therefore, that's a test that we call the scratch test. You can do that. You can also take a magnet and See if, it's, if the magnet is attracted to the stone, if it'll stick on it. And you could do the string on a magnet and see if it'll swing over to it. So all these kind of things help, but really it's so tough to tell if you have a meteorite and it's even tougher to tell when you send us pictures on Facebook and, um, and on the internet. And, and sometimes the pictures just aren't good enough, but when we can really tell we have a meteor is, our meteorite is when we pick it up on our hand and look at it up close because the people that are in this hobby handle so many of them, we quickly know just by looking at it if it's a meteorite or not. I'm going to show you a picture of two different stones up close. So this is a stone that was sold as a meteorite to somebody, a friend of mine who bought it and paid good money for it. And this is a stone that I found that is a meteorite. And I want to show you how similar they are. So you can see how easy it is to be tricked by these two different rocks that look very similar to the naked eye, to the untrained eye. So anyway, that's kind of how you can tell if you have a meteorite or not. Uh, more information on uh, some really good websites. So uh, one website I want to put down here, I already showed you earlier, and I'll just show you again right now, is the Johnson Space Center. This is NASA's website out of Houston, Texas at the Johnson Space Center where they have the, I think it's called the Astro Materials Research and Exploration Science Department. And they have that great website you're looking at right now that shows you all the recent falls. Another good website I recommend to you is the American Meteor Society and the uh, Meteoritical Society. These are great websites. We showed you the Report of Fireball. I'll put that up on the screen as well. All these are great sites for you to check out if you want to learn more about meteorites. And I hope I answered all your questions. This is a really long, painful video. I apologize for that. But there's a lot of information I wanted to pass on to you guys. I wanted to talk to you about all the different concerns I saw in the comments and kind of debunk all that stuff. Again, I hope someday that that mathematician shows up on my one of my videos and is able to work backwards in that equation and give us an exact or pretty close to exact speed. But um, that is the hole. That's how I found it. There was a rock in the hole. It's from space. It is what it is. Anyway, thanks for hanging out today. I hope you guys learned something. If you have any questions, my email is down in the description of this video and the description of all my videos. And you can leave a comment down below. I answer all my comments as well. I try to. So... Leave a comment or, or you can email me if it's a real detailed question. Happy to answer any questions you might have. That's a fantastic and fun hobby. I've learned so much about science just by this facet of treasure hunting. I do consider this a form of treasure hunting. I'm a meteorite hunter. That's mostly what I do. I'm not so much a collector. I'm more of a meteorite hunter.
So anyway, that's it for now. Again, thanks for hanging out. I'll catch you guys next time. Take care.